Good morning. The Lord be with you. Wonderful to see you in worship on this first day of Holy Week. We're celebrating Palm Sunday. If you're a visitor, we're very glad you're with us today. Westminster is a vibrant, inclusive, and caring church. We welcome all people of goodwill. If you're looking for a church home, we'd welcome you into our church family. There will be a couple of prospective member classes in April. The flowers this morning are given to the glory of God and in memory of Art Conley by his wife, Joan. At 1010 this morning, we have two adult classes, one by Rich Williams on the Gospel of Mark. The other class will be taught by Chip Flieger. It's about becoming a lay reader. There's more information on page six. On Tuesday, Alan Kewen will be leading a fascinating tour of the Bible that integrates science, philosophy, history, and other disciplines to gain a deeper understanding of Scripture. There's more information about that on page 5 and the email address so that you can receive the Zoom link for that class. That's Tuesday. The Holy Week schedule is on the back of your bulletin. Remember that... Um, to fully embrace the joy of Easter, it helps to walk this final week of Jesus' life. Hope you'll join us on Maundy Thursday as we remember those final hours at services at 7. Then on Saturday, we'll have the Easter Vigil at 5. Next Sunday morning, two morning worship services. They are identical. You can come at either 9 o'clock or 11 o'clock, and there'll be a free Easter breakfast between the services from 10 to 11. At 10.15, there will be an Easter egg hunt, but in order to join that frenzy, you have to be under 11 years old. <laughs> Let's begin our worship by sharing the peace of Christ with one another.
Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. God does not give us a spirit of cowardice, but seeks to inspire in us courage, determination, and hope. Praying together, mighty God, week after week we yearn to deepen our faith, but the cross is too threatening for us. We turn away and seek comfort, not sacrifice. We embrace privilege, not pain. Yet the suffering love of Christ touches us deeply. We yearn to be faithful to you, but we are weak and afraid. Grant us strength and courage, O God, that we may become genuine disciples of Christ. Amen. There is greater love in God than sin in us, and in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Let all God's people say, Amen. Amen.
you for singing with the adult choir this morning. That's wonderful. We're going to come down here on the floor. I'd like to invite the other children who are in the congregation to join us. We're going to sit here and we're going to look this way. We're going to see something. Come over here and join me. Come here. There we go. Good. This morning, all of us waved palm branches, and we were singing all glory, laud, and honor to the Redeemer King. Now our storytellers, come sit on the floor with me right here. Our storytellers are going to tell us the story about Jesus entering Jerusalem. Want to come sit here? Great. Today, we're going to use our imaginations and we're going to climb into one of the favorite stories in the Bible. Get your imaginations going now. Now, inside this story, there are many components. There are people, places, and things. Things like, um, well, there's the weather, for instance. It's a beautiful day today in the Holy Land. The sky is clear, the sun is shining. It's a beautiful day for a walk. It's a little hot, so what we'd like you to do right now is use your imagination, take out your thermos, unscrew it. Let me see you. Let's see. I don't want anyone to get out the here. Come heat on. stroke or anything like that, and just Come take on. some sips. Take some sips. Come on, choir. Come on. Okay. Mm, mm, mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, because it is hot. Okay, so we're back on. We're ready. Ready for a walk. Now, I want you to also imagine that this here is a road. Mm -hmm. It's a road, and at the way back, there's Jerusalem, and up here is the Mount of Olives. Now, this road isn't like I-95. <laughs> it's not paved. It's a dirt road. And when you walk on it, it gets really dusty. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now, with Jerusalem far away in the back, we've got a little village closer where Robin is. Right there. See where the village Robin is? Robin is sort of the symbol of the little charming village right there. And in that village, there is a donkey. She is not the donkey. <laughs> she is the village. Yeah. Yeah. And there are people, lots of people. There are Jesus and the disciples, and there are the men and women and children who were following Jesus, and they're going to line this whole row at one point, shouting and greeting Jesus, saying what? What do they say? Hosanna. Can you say it? Hosanna. 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 Oh, we're going to have to get a little louder than that. Hosanna. Hosanna. Very okay. good. Okay. Okay. All right, so with that context, with that background, we're going to now climb inside this story. Everyone climb inside, right. climb and, inside, and look around. And we're going to hear this story from the book of Mark in the Bible, okay? So Jesus said, untie the donkey. Mm -hmm. No, no. Jesus approached Jerusalem with his followers and his disciples. They were in a village called Bethpage in Bethany, and it was near the Mount of Olives. Now Jesus, he sent two of his disciples, and he said, go to that village there. You see it? Robin. The one facing you. Robin. Yeah. <laughs> And there you will find a colt, which has never been ridden before. Untie it and bring it here. Now, if anyone says to you, what are you doing with that colt? Just say, the master has need of it and will send it back right away. And, and so... And so... And so the two disciples went. And guess what? They found the colt tied just as Jesus had said. They untied the colt, and when they did, there were these men standing nearby who said, Hey, hey, wait a minute. What are you doing untying that colt? 
And they gave the answer that Jesus had told them, and the men let them go. So they led the colt back to Jesus, and they put their cloaks on its back, and Jesus got up and sat on the colt. Now many of the people took off their cloaks, and they spread them on the road. And others spread their greenery on the road. Yes. Mm -hmm. And people who were in front and those who followed all were singing together, Hosanna! Hosanna! Let's try that again. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hosanna! 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 Hosanna in in the the highest. highest! Hosanna in the highest. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's all pray together. Dear God, thank you for Jesus, who is our King. Amen. Great. Thank you for coming up this morning. Wasn't that great? Those are some serious palms. Can you picture Jesus at the head of this populous procession heading down the Mount of Olives and then up the hill into Jerusalem? Can you imagine Jesus riding very slowly as all these supporters gather around? Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on this small colt, his closest followers encircling him. People were waving palm branches. Some were taking off their cloaks, throwing them on the road in front of him, a poor man's red carpet treatment. Parents hoisted up their children, put them up on the shoulders so they could view the spectacle. What was going on? Why the fanfare? Jesus and his followers had entered countless communities before. What was different about this entrance? Now, some have remade this Palm Sunday procession into something sort of akin to our Thanksgiving Day parades. We wave palm branches as if they were pom-poms and shout Hosanna, the same way a crowd might say, hooray, go for it. Admittedly, we're missing the floats, the giant helium-filled cartoon characters floating overhead. But we know the atmosphere that surrounds a parade. However, I fear that over time, the church has siphoned off the vigor of that first Palm Sunday processional by replacing the original event with something far tamer. The Disney veneer that's been tacked on belies the essence of what Jesus and his followers were up to that day. Make no mistake, Jesus' entry into the holy city was no spur-of-the-moment decision. He carefully calculated his entrance. During the course of his ministry, Jesus visited a number of villages throughout Palestine. However, at some point, he heard God's whisper in his soul to chart his course to Jerusalem. And once Jesus was in the vicinity of this heavyweight city, he planned his appearance to coincide with the Passover feast. 
That was the great religious festival when Jews celebrated God liberating them from their slavery in Egypt. Pilgrims came from as far away as Damascus and Athens and Babylon. They streamed into the city, swelling the population to four or five times its normal size. Now that the people were living under the oppressive regime of Rome, they dreamt of another liberation. Each year, this was the worst week on Pontius Pilate's calendar. With more than 200,000 Jews celebrating an earlier freedom from bondage, Jerusalem was a tinderbox that any spark might ignite. It fell to Pilate, the Roman governor of this territory, to ensure that nothing went haywire. Now, Pilate actually lived 60 miles to the west in a posh villa overlooking the turquoise, pristine waters of the Mediterranean. Each year at Passover, he marched into Jerusalem with a show of force to remind everyone who's in charge. Surrounded by soldiers, Pilate rode through the west gate of Jerusalem atop a mighty stallion. Onlookers gathered around the side of the road to witness and probably to shudder this intimidating scene and this show of muscle. I picture the scene sort of similar to the, those black and white newsreels from the 30s and 40s that show Nazi soldiers marching across Europe. First century Jews despised the Romans. The Romans subdued them with strict laws, tormented them with heavy taxes, terrorized them with occasional brutality. The people longed for a Messiah to show up and set things right. Many imagined that the Messiah would come with an equally impressive army and topple the Romans. They yearned for a king who would deliver justice and peace. A colleague says that when Jesus rode into Jerusalem to the cheers of his followers, it was a parade of hope. Now, some parades are merely entertainment. People throw beads and candy at entertainment parades. But if the parade is about truth, if the parade is about our lives together, it's a parade of hope. Of course, if it's a parade of hope for some, it's a threat to others. No matter what change is desired, there's some people who don't want to see change. Although it had the feel of a parade, people shouting and waving palm branches torn from the palm trees, the procession into Jerusalem wasn't really a parade. At least, that's not what we would call it today. Today, we'd call it a protest march. Later in the week, when Jesus is arrested and dragged before Pontius Pilate, what's the question he asks him? Are you the king of the Jews? The day Jesus entered Jerusalem was the day his followers changed from passive observers to protesters. Up to this point, his followers had mainly been onlookers. They had watched Jesus heal. They had listened to Jesus teach. They'd witnessed him confront religious leaders, but most of the time they were pretty short on action. Palm Sunday was the day they engaged in peaceful resistance. It was the moment when they very clearly announced their allegiance, not to Caesar, but to Jesus. Not to Rome, but to the kingdom of God. One theologian writes, those hosannas were the hopeful cries of people yearning for freedom. Those hosannas were an investment of hope in the one they believed could deliver. 
And I would add, those hosannas were not muffled by the harsh reality of the world they knew. They were shouts of hope for the world they were seeking. Jesus envisioned a world where love ruled, where all were treated fairly, where everyone lived together in harmony. It's not easy to hang on to hope when everything around you seems hopeless. But we followers of Jesus cling to hope. Because we believe God never tires from leading the world to a better day. No matter how many obstacles we humans construct, God keeps presenting us with workarounds to circumvent our disasters and lead us toward the light. A colleague tells about a fascinating fact she learned while she was vacationing in the Italian Alps. In 1848, construction began on a railway pathway through a portion of the Alps called the Semarine. The goal was to connect Venice with Vienna, allowing for an easy transportation of goods and people from the coast to the center of Europe. To no one's surprise, many said, it can't be done. The mountains are too steep. The risk of avalanche, too much. The winter months, too harsh. Couldn't construct anything in those days. And the elevation, oh, it's far too high. But still, the project's designer, Carl von Gega, just kept pressing on. And after seven years of construction, the rail line consisted of 14 tunnels, 16 viaducts, 100 stone arches, and 11 bridges. It had been worked on by 20,000 construction workers. But finally, the construction project, the one deemed impossible, was complete. Europe had their first train crossing through the Alps. Now, while the construction of this daunting project is impressive, the thing that's more amazing is the fact that when this rail pass was built, there was not a train in existence that could make the trip. At the time they built the track, no trains could handle that steep grade or sharp turns. Four different locomotives tried, they all failed, forcing the train companies to build and design a new train with the strict goal of conquering that mountain pass. Those 20,000 workers from Austria and Italy and Germany came together day after day in miserable conditions to build a track for a train that did not yet exist which can only mean that those construction workers, they believed, they believed deep in their bones that someday a train would come. It takes a lot of hope to live like that. But you can take that seven and a half hour train ride today. In the letter to the Hebrews, we read, faith is the assurance of things hoped for the conviction of things not seen. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, if you lose hope, you lose the vitality that keeps life moving. You lose the courage to be and the quality that helps you go on in spite of it all. Followers of Jesus say yes to life because we believe that God will lead us to a better day. Even when we cannot see it, 
even when we cannot put our hands on it, we lean into the future believing that the kingdom of God is slowly taking root. Either you live with hope or you live with despair. Which one will you choose? of life with our morning tithes and offerings.
we unite our hearts and minds in prayer. Loving God, our Lenten journey is winding down as we remember Jesus' final week. He gathered with his followers in Bethany to secure a colt for his momentous ride. And on the back of this humble animal, he rode down the Mount of Olives and up into the holy city, surrounded by supporters. He bypassed a grand stallion in favor of a humble colt. In harmony with your will, he refused to project the coercive power of force in favor of the persuasive power of love. He calculated his entrance to coincide with the Passover feast when his people celebrated their liberation from Egypt. Now they dreamt of freedom from the Roman occupation and hoped Jesus was the one to usher in a new realm, a virtuous realm based on divine principles. Oh God, we are awed by the courage of Jesus to face his adversaries armed only with love and truth and a passion for justice. If we could muster just a fraction of his fearlessness, we would draw closer to the life you beckon us to live. We would reject self-indulgent ways and love without restraint. We would dismiss self-serving fiction and seek your truth. We would spurn favored status and devote ourselves to the common good. Lord, inspire us to become more faithful in following the way Jesus showed us. Everlasting God, there are times when the evils of our day overwhelm us. We witness countless acts of violence, greed, bigotry, deceit, injustice, we often plead for you to right the wrongs, yet we know you call on us to resist evil and to shed light where darkness reigns. You command us to love with Christ-like love, to promote justice, to strive with all our being for peace. Eternal energy of the universe, fill us with courage to stand against abusive power. Fill us with compassion so that we may give ourselves away in love. And fill us with righteousness so that we may work for justice and peace in our homes, in our communities, and in our world. Now, oh God, we join our voices as one in the prayer Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
And now may grace, peace, joy, and especially hope be with you this day and forever. Amen.